as we begin our final portion of the program before ending our conference with the cocktail hour and vendor showcase. All right, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming a Silicon Valley icon who helped shape the computing industry with his design of Apple's first line of products, Apple One and Two, and has contributed so much more to the field as an entrepreneur and a philanthropist for more than 40 years. Please put your hands together for the amazing Steve Wozniak. Either one. Was or Steve or Mr. Wozniak, I don't care. Either one. Okay. So we're going to get started. We have some questions here that we are going to ask. And of course, there will be time for you all to ask questions towards the end. So get those ready um, for a few more in a few more minutes. Steve, why don't you tell us, uh, <coughs> why don't you know, you know, we've all been in this pandemic mode for a while. Uh, is there something that you learned? about yourself during this, this time period, during the past two years, or, or was there something that um, you missed? I'd say that at least I learned things about myself or confirmed them, which is I was just getting so tired of constant busyness and travel, and then COVID came. Um, oh yes, I had COVID before it was in this country, came back from uh, China. Came back from China, January 4th, 2020. Horrible, nobody should get that, absolutely. Had one close friend die of it too, but it was the worst thing my wife and I ever had. Well, then we so then restrictions finally came into place, and they called it um, stay at home or something at home. I called it reside at home, R.I.P. <laughs> so, so a lot of restrictions. It was the most wonderful thing that ever happened. My wife and I both say 2020 and most of 2021 were the most wonderful years of our life because you know what. Nobody was on the roads. You could go anywhere, and I just treated the car like an extension of the home. We'll go somewhere, but not stay overnight. We'll drive back. And we took about 40 trips to every corner of California, to national parks, saw things that were just so amazing. And uh, we did that every few days with all four of our dogs. We'd just drive somewhere and, and do it. We'd talk together. We'd listen to audio books. We'd listen to music. And a great time together. We love to drive long trips. So. Um, that was a real good time for us, man. We just got a lot of things cleared up in our home. Went through, uh, in 2021, though, we had a dying relative out in Kansas, so a lot of trips out there. And uh, got something, I, I, for 50 years, I said, I'm gonna, Colorado's the best place to live, and we bought a home in Colorado, so we're gonna move when we get time. Okay. But um, I didn't miss anything. I mean, things had disappeared. My wife and I used to, well, first of all, I had my travel schedule for appearances like this, and that goes away. Good. And we went to a lot of movies together. That went away, movie theaters. Yeah. We don't watch TV, so now we get in the habit of watching TV for movies. You know, Netflix and all that. We got into that. Um, last. Favorite show? Um, a favorite show? No, over all time, The Big Bang Theory. But now we just usually go to Netflix and pick out a movie, you know, okay. and a lot of, a lot of movies. A lot of we do in that we enjoy now. And we go to a lot of concerts, dozens of concerts a year. Never the big groups, only the little tiny places that are two hours away during rush hour up in San Francisco. We live by the bigger city, San Jose. So that was, so we, concerts are out, movies are out. We go to restaurant every day, restaurants are out. Just uh, fell in love with, you know, gamble soup. <laughs> um, but didn't miss anything. All these things that were gone, no, you don't miss them. I remember once I was on a cruise and I went three weeks, no computer, no cell phone. Three weeks, and when I got back, nothing was really missed, I mean, the world's still going on, so I kind of already knew that, but um, no. So anyway, COVID was the best thing in my life, in a way. Okay. Not, not, for, not for humanity. Good and bad. Good and bad. Yes. All right, a couple more questions here. Um, there are hundreds of people here wanting to know more about you, and of course wanting to know more about technology and the things that you've done. But I wanted to find out a little bit more about um, Steve, younger Steve, 
growing up. Did you um, attend your high school reunion? Well, see, growing up to me was elementary school. A whole bunch of electronics, computer stuff when it did not exist. There was nothing in the world to even find out how it did. And I did. I just sort of taught myself. But high school reunions, um, I went to every one that I that happened for our high school. I um, I believe very strongly in all the institutions that got me to where I got in life, and I gave back very heavily to all my schools. But going to high school reunions was um, was nice. The thing is, I was a geek. I was a total geek. I didn't have any friends in high school. One or two, you know, little geeks that wouldn't even come to a reunion. So I barely knew anybody. But they were people there were very nice to me. And one of the reunions, I just didn't rekindle, we didn't know each other really, but met one of the one of the girls that had gone with us, and I was in all the smart classes, so I knew all the smart people, and she was like the smartest one. And we got together and we got married. <laughs> Not to this day, but I, I felt it was so smart to marry somebody your age and not younger, and you have similar experiences in life and similar views of how the world evolved at the same periods of time. So that was, and that was really good, good part of it, really good. I remember, I know I read that you were shy, so that's why I wanted to know if you, you know, attended the high school reunion or not. When did your kids realize you were a big deal? Oh, I think, I think they kind of knew it suddenly, but the thing is, when you are a big deal, you don't, I think it's normal, you don't tell your kids that. You kind of keep them out of it. You keep them out of seeing groups that come to hear you talk and things like that. And uh, I did an extreme measure on that. So. You know, my young son was really skilled in computers, though, for some reason. And, and, and man, he was teaching me things, how to do them. He was so cool. And, and uh, one time, went to L.A. to watch me get filmed for an Apple commercial, maybe. And uh, they shot some pictures of us out in a park in L.A. with buildings behind us with me and my son, both of us with our laptops open. That laptops were brand new for, for uh, back then from Apple. And they put these big billboards all over the country, me and my son. So he must have realized yeah. something, but we never had direct conversation about it ever. Um, you know, what it is or, you know, how to handle it. I think they just understand that's how it was. Yeah. All right. So you've been skeptical of the rush to cloud computing. What is it that worries you about it? And what are other current trends in tech that concern you? Well, whenever anybody says you have to go some way, I almost oppose it. Creative people tend to think, oh, no, no, leave doors open, let us find our own ways. And it bothers me, and things started moving towards the cloud. And I grew up in a world where you owned something. And you owned it. It was maybe a car, maybe it was, was you know, a golf club, but you were, it was precious. You put it in a closet, maybe a vacuum cleaner, you could pull it out 40 years later, it's still there, it's still worth saying, you took care of it. And uh, the days of you owning things seem to have gone away. And that, so a lot of things about technology bother me to this day. And uh, oh my gosh, everything I want that sounds good, I have to sign up and pay money and give my name and passwords and remember, try to remember them all. You know, you have to write them down. It's um and 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 but then it's like the changes in what I'm using. Good, I like it. This is helping me. And all of a sudden, it changes. Uh, now I have to learn the new modality, the new way. Even if it's just just a product, where where do they move these things to? The, that were here and accessible before. And that, that bothers me. I like consistency. I like things to, if I know something, I like to be able to apply myself and get it done. And I don't like it when things don't work. Um, to me, the most important thing about new technology is, does it act like, treat you like a human? What does that mean? That means it acts like another human, a friend that knows you and knows how to treat you and what to say to you and how to answer your questions. And, and uh, does it feel like that or does it feel like technology? It feels like technology. I have to modify myself and try to remember all this stuff. Then technology is one out over humans. If technology wins, we have to modify our behaviors and ourselves to get things done. If humans win out over technology, the people who create technology put everything into them to work in natural human ways. This goes back to, even, you know, when we were starting out with the Lisa computer, became the Macintosh program. And we said, you don't call a screen a screen. You call it a desktop because people are familiar with the desktop. It's a place you put things. And you know, we started trying to let people live more naturally. You know, if you saw an icon and it looked like a paintbrush, what does it do? It paints. You know, that was a huge start way back when. Nowadays, you just think, oh, that's common. Nobody would do it any differently. But 
Um, no, that was um, very uh, incredible to take the world towards a step where the human is more important. They called it ease of computing. Apple got a reputation for that. Yeah, very proud of it. Um, that's how it should always be. Those of us who don't know that much about it as we're older, or even newcomers, should have all the support and answers they can get to. Nowadays, talk about support. Try to get a human for almost any of these major tech programs. You're online, this and that, and you're just trying to get a human to fix a problem. And uh, it can be so hard. I forget what the one I had two, two days ago was. But I never got to the human, so I'll just have to wait for some months till I have time enough to deal with it the hard way. So how many of us um, older folk breathe a sigh of relief to hear that the great Steve Waz gets frustrated with technology too? <laughs> Yeah, I, I sometimes say that those who brought us the digital world should be executed. But now, now I say those who brought us the digital world should be forced to live in it. The best products really come from people who, who are the market that's being sold to. And they develop, if they develop the product, they know how to make it right. Put the right things in, the wrong things out. Steve Jobs, you know, kicking out all the ideas that the engineers had for an iPhone. Make it simple enough for a normal person to use. That's where you get the greatest products. So we talked a lot about innovation here today, and obviously Apple was and continues to be a very innovative company. How do you make innovation a part of an organization, and how do you keep it alive as you grow larger? Apple might be not the best example. All the big tech companies have so much money. They can easily look around and sniff as well as anyone and see what's coming up from outside companies that might affect our business or have a role in making it better, and then you have a lot of acquisitions of those sort of companies. So the ones who are innovators, I'm coming up with some little new idea, I'm practicing going in the laboratory and making it work. A lot of them have an exit strategy, a way to get money by being acquired. Now a company like Apple just sits back and says, what is our reputation? We're gonna make good products for people that actually work for them and help them with their the things they do in life. And we don't make crummy products. And also Apple sometimes is a leader in very important ways. For example, um, it used to be that Android phones, you could actually tap and pay. So I had to buy one of the two Android phones in the world that could do it and go down to Walgreens and tap and pay. Well, first I had to unlock the, the, that Android phone with an unlock code. Then I had to select an app and then I had to select a credit card. Then I had to type in the unlock, the pin for the credit card and then I could tap and pay. Wait a minute, a credit card is easier than that. Totally shook my belief in technology. But then Apple first came up with Touch ID. You touch it, and with 3D measurement of your fingerprint, it knows it's you. And then all the other, all the other phone companies, you know, and the Android phones and all that, they all came in and did the same thing after Apple. But then Apple went to tap and pay. All you would do is hold your phone out, don't even unlock it, and just tap with your finger, and that pays. I mean, that was just so wonderful a change, you know. And now my biggest piece of technology I love the most is probably my Apple Watch even though I wear a nice, beautiful Omega. <laughs> well, mechanical watch is gonna do what you expect. You never know with the digital one, but the Apple watch is tap, tap. <laughs> hey, everywhere I go, oh my gosh, it's so easy. I don't even have to take out a phone. I don't have to do any face ID or unlocking or any of that stuff. Um, so you're noting the Waz wears two watches, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sometimes I wear two, two mechanical watches even. Um, it's just a, a thing of beauty. Yeah. And Omega's into, you know, things like outer space, and I've got a company going there. So technology, which technologies do you think offer the best opportunities for the next groundbreaking disruption? Like I said, I read the same magazine articles as everyone else, you know. They've been talking about quantum computing. Quantum computing might be able to solve some problems very efficiently, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and don't quite see it having a universal solution that's better than what's before and lower cost and all that. So will it happen or won't it? You never know. Every once in a while, something sits around for 10 years trying to happen, and my gosh, it does happen. But sometimes the impossible is impossible. Um, be interesting to see if one computing can do a million, infinite calculations all at the same time. Be interesting, but we're getting to the point that it's kind of difficult to do, almost like in, in making chips that do more and more every year, forever and ever, and now instead of one transistor, we put 60 billion transistors on one chip, you know, for like a 25 cent manufacturing cost. You know, and that's what makes computers smart, but, um, you know, it's like Moore's Law has to taper off and not be able to make computers faster and faster and better and better every year. 
and will that happen with quantum? Then there's artificial intelligence. Everything we, computer technology, it's called artificial intelligence. Well, artificial intelligence has a couple of categories. Play a game a billion times. No human being can play a game a billion times and memorize all the outcomes and put them in the sense of how to play that game, chess or whatever. So the fact that the computer is very, very fast gives it a big advantage, not in the method to solve the problem. We have to even teach the computers, here's how you're going to solve this problem. Here's what you're going to try to do very, very fast. Here's how you're going to measure yourself, successes and failures and all. And we get a little tiny category of things. One example I'd like to use is Google, show it 80,000 pictures of dogs, and Google can recognize a dog faster than any human. Ah, smarter than any human, right? They call it AI. But Google just sees a dog, doesn't know if it's a dog standing there or a picture on a wall. You know, and a one-year-old child, I have grandchildren, one-year-old child say, that's a dog. And they know it's a dog. It walks, it has limbs that are kind of hard and kind of soft, and they're flexible. And the dog chooses where it's going to go and has a brain, thinks, and has eyes. The child, the one-year-old child knows what a dog is. And Google doesn't know what a dog is. And we fool ourselves into thinking that AI, the A is correct. I agree with the A, but not the I. It's not intelligence. We do not know what human intelligence is. We do not know how the brain works. If we did, we could make a brain. I was in one company where the engineers did figure out how to make a brain. They said it takes nine months. <laughs> And, and I just, um, uh, you know, what a brain is, we don't understand yet. We keep trying to probe and probe. We don't even know that our memories are in the brain. I'm going to tell you that. When I went back to get my degree from Berkeley, I went back as a psychology major. I wanted to study the brain like computers, and I want to study memory especially. There's no book in the world that says how memory, how you could identify any one memory in a brain. You can identify some neurons that process certain memories process it, but that's not it is the memory. What is the memory? Um, you know, like uh, uh, after Singularity, Ray Kurzweil wrote the book Transcendence, where you could map all the memories out of a brain and put it in a computer. And maybe later, eventually, somebody could live forever and get the memories put back and be who they were. Um, but I came up with, 40 years ago, I came up with uh, the strongest correlation that any, any correlation in a book is this, what memories might be. And my correlation was, you lose two things between the ages of six and 10. You lose your childhood autobiographic memories, things that happen, and you lose your teeth. And I put that out there to my class to show that if that's the strongest statement that can be made, and we know memories aren't the teeth, it just shows you how weak our understanding of what real memories are made out of. You Google memory and teeth these days, you're gonna be shocked what you find though, it's really funny. <laughs> Technology is moving forward so fast today. What advice do you have for organizations to help them keep up with the pace of change? You know, when the internet first came in, I was a network administrator out of my house, which is the one part of Silicon Valley with no broadband, but I could pay for a T1 line one and a half megabits. Everybody else was dial up at 2400 baud, you know. Dial, I was king of the hill. So I ran servers for companies, for well-known musicians, for um, other famous hackers and the like. I ran servers in my house. I actually uh, went through, I was a network administrator for 10 years. It's the most thankless job in the world. And the, we did, now, now we've got enough backgrounds, three decades later, that you can set up, you know, all the internet switches, the routers they're called. And set up the protocols they'll use to be able to get your signal from here to there. And, uh, but back then, man, it was, and I, I ran my own server, my DNS servers, my email servers, my web servers right out of the house, programmed all myself. Um, that was, um, those were tough times. So the change was so fast. Every time there was change, you need some new training and all that. It doesn't apply anymore. And uh, we've gone so far from dial-up to, you know, the incredible broadband we have today. Even cellular. When we started Apple, cellular didn't exist, you know. Cellular came along, broadband came along, digital came along. <laughs> All these things, they all kind of go to go together. But um, uh, the change of pace for companies is how do you keep up? The trouble is you buy a lot of IT equipment for yourself. Although nowadays it's more common. We just let other people that run all the equipment, let them do it. We'll just subscribe to it, do it virtually, set up our, our web pages and all that. But it's a lot of equipment and what happens when a change comes? Well, very fortunately when you're um, 
you're getting your virtual machines, it's called, out there on the internet somewhere, it's very easy to say, just change my machine to one that has more memory, or change it to a different kind of machine. You can actually uh, influence your outcome. So the people who are kind of running that have a lot of outs that we didn't have in the early days, where if something went wrong, you had to find the wire, the little piece of software, update a computer, whatever. Um, we're a little past that. It's a little more understandable. However, the last thing you think of, you always want to create new abilities for people when you're creating products and you're a big company. The last thing you think of is security. We'll add security at the end. You don't like usually start with the security core and build out from it. That's your second try. And so why do we read about so many huge intrusions of, you know, it was 10,000 of people at first. And, you know, I said, oh, I, I, I don't really trust this internet. It's just going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people whose records get exposed, discovered, and things that you wouldn't normally show to other people or make public. And uh, what, have, what have we done that can really stop that? Just about nothing. We're always looking for it, trying to spot it when it happens. And even the people who are working hard to be secure have accidents come along and then discover, oh, we've got to now take more steps to make it secure in another way. Apple has updates for security like every week. <laughs> right. You mentioned this, you touched on this a, a bit about AI, but we see so much innovation coming out of Silicon Valley and everywhere, actually. What excites you the most about the new technologies out there? Um, I'm not going to talk about AI, but machine learning, cryptocurrencies, and well, AI is, you know, is just the promise of the high end of what computers can do today. And I find it, oh, it just knows where I would want to drive today. And that, that you know, I'll want to get a birthday cake for my son today. And knows that kind of stuff. But then it makes a guess that, oh, here's where you want to go today. And it doesn't realize, sorry, this Thursday is a holiday. Do you know what a holiday is? Uh, a computer doesn't know what a holiday is, what things are. It just sort of has some patterns that's been trained that are pretty good most of the time, but when they aren't, uh, you know, how do you get around it, and unmess it, and make it the way you wanted it? Um, so that's AI and cryptocurrency is just attracting the whole world of creative entrepreneurial people, people with a, a young mindset that haven't found a way into business yet, and this might be a way for them. And everywhere you go, it's, it's fading. It comes and it fades, and it comes and it fades a bit. But um, young people, and that's really good because that's true innovation, like when we started Apple. Just look at it around. Is there something I can do that's valuable? And then I'll share it, I'll give it to the world, I'll share it with the world. And, and uh, I, my stuff, I didn't do to, to start an industry or a company. That just sort of came about. I was going to do it for other reasons, make it great computers. But um, so that, and you know, and other things that are going on today attracted my interest electric vehicles. I'm glad we're moving in that direction. But you know what? I, my reasons are very weak. It's not that I'm sure that electric vehicles are more cost effective. You know, there's everyone with them says they are. But, um, you know, I own electric vehicles and I'm not so sure I agree with that. And um, electric vehicles, I'm an electrical person in my life. I study electrical engineering, you know, and I had mechanical engineering courses, but I'm not so much a mechanical engineer. I. And so getting away from engines and going to motors is, just feels good, but only for a personal reason. Not that I can put down in a spreadsheet and absolutely you know, claim that the cost is justified. But I'm kind of glad to see the world moving into new modes of behavior. You know, And eventually we're probably going to have almost all electric vehicles, even in this country. And uh, so I'd like to see that kind of huge change. It's kind of like you, know, you used to have to uh, go to a store to buy things came the internet. I said, oh my gosh, it's going to take over. Everything in our life makes sense. All the promises, they all got funded, and then there was a big dot-com bust. Because they can't, everything in your life can't change in, in just a few years. It takes a while. Now everything in our lives, including purchasing things, is on the internet. All those companies that invested were correct. They were just in the wrong time frame of how long things take to happen. And I'm kind of glad, though, to see that I can just go on to Amazon, buy something, have it delivered to the house, and and, um, you know, and, and everything like when I'm on the street with Uber or whatever. So a lot of these changes in lifestyle, you know, and we've also, technology gives us, you know, our low cost home security, you know, cameras that we can look at from here. I can raise a garage door if I have to, or close one that I forgot to close, you know. It seems 
like it all falls in line with your philosophy, with, with why you invented the computer. Is you want to make life easier, you want to do good, and you want to find things that um, complement our lives. I want to be an engineer to, to complement our lives, to make our lives better. Um, as far as computers, that was just a skill I had, and I was going to build a certain type of computer five years ahead of the rest of the world. I was going to build it in a certain year. And it didn't, there wasn't any drive for a company. It was just a club of people that said, oh, Stanford professors, you know, talking about how once we have a computer, we have a problem, we can write it and solve it better than the big, huge million dollar mainframes our companies have. And education is going to be increased because you get your answer. Is your answer right or wrong? You get told immediately. And I know from my psychology experience that immediacy of reward and punishment um, uh, is very is very important because if your dog poops on the floor and you whack it on the head 12 hours later it doesn't learn so learning immediacy you know finding out if your answer is right or wrong i thought we were going to turn out the brightest people 10 times brighter than we are i was a little scared for a while thinking that thought actually that i wouldn't have a place in 10 years you know with my mind and um and uh, we haven't got there yet. I have. I do want to see. Uh, I do want to see us get there someday. That, that people turn out just so much brighter and happier with education than they are today. Speaking of ten years, how do you see our relationship with technology changing in the years ahead? Ten years is both short time and a long time because there's new things that'll come up every year. How could I predict what's going to happen in ten years? When we started Apple, the big computer companies looked at us and couldn't predict it was going to be a market for these little small computers, that it was going to be worth any money. A Hewlett Packard, where I worked, turned me down five times for the personal computer. And uh, um, it just wasn't visible. So that's how you see something 10 years out. Um, my greatest hope is, I don't, my hopes aren't what's going to really happen. But my greatest hope is that we figure out ways to, to cut the spam. You know, cut the unneeded intrusions in our life, and it comes in every communication modality I have. And um, it's people, it's people that are thinking really evil thoughts and using, you know, internet openness and stuff like that. If you think about it, when we grew up, we had fax machines. Every fax machine had a phone number. If anybody knew your phone number, they could send you all the junk they wanted to your fax machine. Didn't really happen. I think phone calls were too expensive back then. You, you talk about phone calls, it reminds me of something um, that you write about in your book, the dial and joke. I am so proud of dial a lot of things I've done in my life that were kind of like businesses, but I was just out of college, three years of college actually, and I got a job, um, I got a job for as a technician for six months and then in design engineer Hewlett Packard without a college degree. But your biggest expense then, I, was, I finally was able to move out on my own from my family and unburden them. And your biggest expense is your apartment rent. Okay, well I had a job and I could pay for my apartment back then. All you needed, you know, was one simple job, normal type job. Any, any, any um, humble job would actually allow you to have a home eventually and a family and clothing and food and everything with only one person in the family working. This was, this was how it was, 50s, 60s. And, uh, but anyway, your most important, your biggest expense out of college is, is your apartment rental. And then I wanted to do a dial a joke, which didn't exist in the San Francisco Bay Area. Very few dial a jokes existed in the world, and I had encountered them from a year in college when I was a phone freak. But basically, you, the, the, we had one phone company, it was Monopoly. All your phone lines came to your house from AT&T, Ma Bell, the Monopoly, and you could not own a phone. You could not buy a phone, you could not invent a phone, you could not invent an answering machine or sell one. You had to lease, that means it, Ma Bell still owns it, you leased the Codafone 700 designed for theater, answering machines telling you what time the movies are. And once a day I would record a joke on it. Hello, thank you for dialing, dial a joke. Today's joke is, and I would tell Polish jokes, which were the proper thing to do in that time. <laughs> <laughs> Culture has changed a lot. As a matter of fact, the Polish American Congress Incorporated out of Chicago, um, their lawyer contacted me and I said, well, what if I change my jokes to Italian jokes? They said, that's fine. <laughs> there was no political correctness. I don't believe it's right to stereotype entire groups and don't want to do that. But even if you tell a joke, it doesn't stereotype a group at all, plays a trick on language. And 
you but you use the word Mexican, oh, you'll get in trouble. Um, so dial a joke, I did it all on my own, and it was a huge cost to a young engine. It's the most called single line number in the United States. No extensions. Most called, and it was just one call after another after another. The kids would call it to hear the joke of the day, and every two thousand calls a day would go in my Cupertino apartment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This before Apple. I'm and, sure a lot of the... Um, but I did, I did that all myself. I had no one helping me in any which way. And I'm so proud of it. I still like to look back at my old business cards. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of uh, the audience, the young folks in the audience, had no idea that you didn't own your own phone at one point. If people could not own their own phone, how you had to leave them. Yeah, a very, yeah. very different time. I'm glad we yeah. got away from that. Yeah. Because look at the variety and choice that we get from moving on. Past a monopoly. Are there specific areas of organizations or specific industries that you see as being particularly open to disruption? Disruption kind of was a word that came about a couple of decades ago and kind of was used frequently and it meant, to me it meant, oh, some companies go out of business. They get disrupted that heavily, like Blackberry and Nokia, you know, sometimes, not with the iPhone, the iPhone didn't disrupt them. And the next year it didn't disrupt them. Next year and the next year, but eventually people's tastes had totally changed. So about four or five years later, they were just in a lot of trouble. They hadn't adapted soon enough. Um, disruption can come from unknown sources, and I, I can't. Every industry is subject to disruption. Every industry has gone through phases of disruption now and then. My proposal is that companies should have a chief disruption officer who has a team of people thinking out all these new little technologies that people are playing with that haven't gone anywhere in business yet, that aren't in the business journals, but maybe engineering journals, read about them, think about them, try to predict where they might go, and could they ever disrupt us, or could we use them to disrupt others? And the chief disruption officer should not report to the CEO. The CEO has the most critical job in the world. Make sure your machine keeps earning money. You gotta keep the machine going. You gotta keep the money earning going. And this disruption thinking is not necessarily, you know, the, the, the income of the company right now. So the CDO should report to the board of directors. All right. Well, I have a final question for you. You've accomplished many things in your career. What do you consider to be your greatest achievement? Uh, dial a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, personally, personally, a long time, long time, my whole life I'd hoped for, got to walk my daughter down the aisle. Personal. On a technology level, the Apple II computer was just an amazing thing. It was, you know, it was going to launch a big company. It was going to launch an industry. That one machine was so far ahead of anything else other people were trying. It was also the first time there was a new industry called arcade games that Atari was starting in Los Gatos, California, where I live now. And the Apple II was the first time arcade games would be colored. My computer was also color, but it was more importantly the first time ever that arcade games would be software. You could type in a number to a place in memory and a red dot would appear on your screen. Type in a different number and a purple dot appears. Type in some other address and somewhere else. On the screen. This was amazing. A nine-year-old could write a game with moving colored pieces in one day, a decent game. Before that, it took was hardware games. I'd sit at Atari. I designed Breakout for Atari. 120 chips and a thousand wires and keep everything straight in your head and it would typically take an engineer you know half a year to a year to make a new game prototype that was one day for a nine-year-old so that was an incredible um, start for uh, computers to have this great arcade game world as well um, so the apple II computer influenced everything so much personally i also like the fact that drive motivation is more important than knowledge in creating new things if you want to you will we had a staff meeting at Apple, and Apple was going to be allowed into the Consumer Electronics Show, where all the new hi-fi projects, you know, any techie kid, you know, oh, the latest TVs, the latest VCRs back then. Um, and we were going to be allowed into it in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'd never been to Las Vegas. I heard about it. I wanted to go. I was still young. You know, we're in Apple. And um, only Apple was only going to send three marketing people. Our funder was Rand Marketing, Steve Jobs, and... I think our sales guy, Gene Carter. And I raised my hand in that staff meeting, and I said, and it was, the meet, show was in two weeks, and I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? Mike Barkless said yes. Now, I had never worked with any disk hardware or software in my life. 
but I knew how to figure things out, create things, even with no background. And I'm thinking, if in two weeks I can develop a device that you say, run checkbook, and it runs the checkbook program. They'll have to take me to Las Vegas. I'll be the only one that knows how it works. <laughs> and I work every day, Christmas Day entirely, New Year's Day entirely, working on this, working on this, setting up some formats, figuring out how they worked and stripping out tons of chips on the drive itself and running wires over. Did all that and got it working. And I got to go to Las Vegas, talk to Steve Jobs how to play craps. Right. And my high school programmer friend that was helping me with this, Randy Wigginton, taught him how to play craps too, and he won 35 bucks. <laughs> high schooler. Older Las Vegas. Yeah. It's that motivation. Motivation, I learned that from teaching. I taught elementary and middle school kids for eight years in my life. My courses were full time, like 200 hours per year of having a computer, learning how to use it for all the things going on in your classroom, but also how to use it to have fun and how to maintain it and how to get on networks and meet other people. And this was a thorough class and I got up to uh, even teaching advanced fifth graders and then advanced kids and then teachers all at the same time, I was seven days a week. This was a huge part of my life. Never let the press near it. Didn't want press going near children because they'd read something that wasn't quite what they remembered. And um, the truth was important. I impressed them with that. And, and uh, those classes were important to me, so that was a big deal that you know I put so much into and cared about. And, um, and also, the, yeah, but the floppy disk was kind of cool. <laughs> But I learned in my classes as I taught that it wasn't important. Everything I say is instructive and it tells you what's going on with the computer and how to type, what to type and how to get around it. It's all good information. But as the students, I made the classes so fun and enjoyable with a lot of jokes and all that, the students wanted to participate. And they kind of knew they learned so much more than they would have otherwise. And I never wanted them to be a computer geek to understand how computers work only how to use the computer for classroom assignments. Impress this teacher, the teacher gives you better grades, feel prouder of yourself, and you study even harder. Supposedly something I've learned in psychology, I don't know if it's true. <laughs> okay, so it's time to move into question and answers from our audience. We've learned a lot so far, very engaging. Yes, over here, this gentleman in the hat. Yes, uh, my name is Jonathan Cloud. I run a nonprofit called Possible Planet. And my question is, how can we harness the power of technology to solve the crises that the world faces today? Climate change, biodiversity loss, exceeding the global boundaries. How can we address that using technology? I don't think it's technologists that, um, that affect you. It's, it's your decision. You've got to look at what technology is available and use it in the best possible ways. It's you know your motivation, your direction. Um, somebody like myself can't be doing every single thing in the world, a million things all at once. Um, there's a lot of easy solutions people are doing now, you know, electric cars and solar farms and whatnot. But um, whatever you do, always be honest, study it, make sure your research is good, make sure you know what you're doing, and convince other people of it. Yes, sir. Hi. Pleasure to be here, pleasure to hear you. Uh, I had one question. I run a company called Custom Surgical. And at our company, we believe the future of optical medical imaging is on smartphones. The question for you is, where do you see the future of the smartphones going to? What going to? The, the future of medical? personal smartphones. Well, there's an awful lot of people working on personal medical devices largely that communicate directly with doctors or even give you some advice about what you have. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Apple, you can, you know, at least measure your, your pulse rate and eventually the glucose. So I, I, I think that that's good that people are trying to use technology to uh, make medicine more distributed. I don't know that you have to go to a doctor, a centralized source um, for everything, but a lot of it. Trouble is, beware, artificial intelligence would be a word, say, and our machines work with artificial intelligence. It's not the same equivalent of an intelligence of a doctor. This one may have to stay a lot old school for some time, but I do wish your company well. There's so many areas that technology can be applied to analyzing and making decisions. 
I mean, look how much money was raised by Theranos, you know, with the problem. The idea is good. Yeah, the idea was great. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name's Wilson. I'm a CS undergrad at RIT. Huge fan, uh, like I think most people here. Um, I, uh, the previous speakers uh, today were talking about uh, Concept called hardware as a service, where you rent your rent your hardware and you have to pay for a subscription fee for like updates, upgrades, repairs. Um, you see this with like Teslas, John Deere machinery. Um, and I was wondering if, if you could talk on this uh, kind of concept and uh, if you ever like first saw it as a um, up and coming like uh, pioneer or entrepreneur uh, back in back in the day. Sure, I grew up with things that you own. Records. And now that it turns into software, it not only kind of your feeling of ownership goes away, <clears throat> look at Tesla, the number of changes they'll make that just mess things up. They made one recently and they took out of all the menu system, they took one function out that we needed. And it, you could get to it through voice, except my voice button was bad and it was taken, it was took them over two months to fix that button. Um, I don't know, this world with everything software uh, uh, just doesn't feel good like the old days. It doesn't make me as happy as it should. Yeah, they can have all these updates over the air, but you're paying for it, and are you paying the right amount or not? You don't know. When you buy something, you say, this object I'm buying does something for me, and it's worth this much, and I'll buy it. And then you get, no, no, you have to subscribe you know, per month, and that's the way you can lose track of how much it's really costing, kind of like credit cards. So, um, so I'm not happy about that part of technology, but it'll never go away because everybody's saying, I want to start a Silicon Valley company. I want to start a company in technology. Thinks that way. This is how we've got to model it. You know, kind of like Facebook started with a great idea for getting people together. It didn't start with the idea of, oh, we're going to track them everywhere and, and signal advertisers. And when they hit like, it doesn't go to the person they're liking the post of. It's going to 100 advertisers. That's not how it started. So, uh, um, Going to have to do some thinking about that you know how much do we want the how much do we care about the producer versus the consumer and i'm always for the consumer i'm always for the small guy everywhere in life um, i think we have a question yeah. over here if the iphone never took off would computers evolve like the iphone where you need to get one every year <laughs> uh, I think computers sort of did evolve that way, as well as iPhones, as well as watches, as well as airbuds. Um, it's, it's just the method of marketing. Um, the iPhone, really old iPhones still work fine. You know, I look at my iPhone life, and I've always got kind of the latest, greatest. But is my life doing as much, as fast, as happily as it did 10 years ago? Am I doing the same things? Am I ever really gotten anywhere? Okay, oh, I bought the latest iPhone, now I get faux blue color instead of a faux green color. <laughs> or, you know, I, I call it half moon bay gray in both cases on a foggy day. Um, you know, oh, the number of people that want to get the latest color so they have the latest phone. Wait a minute. What the phone is doing for you is what matters. And uh, we've lost, I think we've lost sight of a lot of things. You know, what does it mean to have something? What is it? So. Anyway, but the iPhone, I'm uh, very glad for the iPhone. It was just a product that said a device can be in your hand and understandable, and it is. And I think the in-the-hand product is really the big future, even for the next 10 years, because cars went for 150 years, pretty much four wheels and a container, and people getting in them for the same purposes in life as now. So uh, I think you, you could hit a format that's really pretty good. As much as you talk about it changing, it's really pretty much the same. So. Handheld of different sizes is going to be quite a deal for a while. So I like what I'm hearing. So I have iPhone 8, so I'm not that bad. So my You're fine. Family. You're happy. And it does what you need. Yeah. <laughs> it does, yeah. Okay, over here. So it was pretty cool hearing about a dial -a joke. And I was hoping you could tell us about uh, an op opposite experience where you uh, maybe experienced failure. What was that like? Did you glean anything from it? Where I had a failure? Yep. Okay, in those days, no failures. I'm sorry, I look back and I cannot believe what I was doing, I look at my own designs, some genius was pouring out of my head for 10 years, magic, just magic, everything I attacked, I approached, I did it better than other people in the world were doing. Um, 
and I don't know how to explain it. it only lasted about 10 years. It went through Apple and a little, and a ways into there. But um, no, I didn't have failures until later in life. Later in life, I did things that couldn't be all met, like price, battery life, and and uh, size, and uh, you know, for GPS uh, tracking devices. And Apple does a pretty good job today with their their little um, finders. I forget what they're called, but you know, I attach it to my car key ever since losing a car key. And uh, but it has to be a certain level of all those things, and I couldn't get the technology. Sometimes things that are impossible really are impossible. And you think just because I've done impossible things before doesn't mean you always can. Um, on the way towards Apple, I developed all sorts of things from you know elementary school on. Little projects, and I'd show friends of mine that I could build with some parts that did funny things. I could go into driver training class in high school and make some sounds like a siren, just to see if people pulled over. And I you know a lot of little funny little things um, that we did, and they weren't worth money, they weren't worth companies, they weren't worth industries, but they were all fun. And every time I did a project, especially when I started designing computers, I made it smaller and smaller and smaller using tricks nobody ever came up with, using some parts twice, using some parts for things they were not intended to even do, but they were the cheapest, smallest solution. And so my mind developed on each one of those steps. I call them steps, not failures. And they were steps that the next project I took on, I was one step ahead in tricks I could pull, plus I could always develop new tricks. So I am, um, yeah, I was, it's so shameful, I just don't have any. Any uh, failures? Like I started on a project and didn't complete it for Apple? No, every one. There were some inventions, though, that got you into trouble. Do you want to talk about any of those? Oh, you get in trouble? Well, sure. The blue box. Um, some of you in here may know what a blue box is. And I read an article <coughs> the day before I was going to go to um, my third year of college. <coughs> I'd taken off a year to work to earn the money for my four-year college so I wouldn't burden my parents. And that was the same year I built an early computer design of mine called the Cream Soda Computer. And um, I met Steve Jobs and took him to my house, showed him all the Bob Dylan albums because he was too young to have albums. And I went off and I read this article by accident called The Secrets of the Little Blue Box, an interesting story. And to me that meant The Secrets of the Little Blue Box, fiction, it's just a story. Start reading about these engineers, phone company engineers. They go tour phone companies and they would set up networks, plug into a payphone in Arizona and set up a network around the world all on their own. These were engineers like I wanted to be. Oh my God, I was so amazed. Halfway through the story, I had to call Steve Jobs and start reading it to him. And I said, There's something wrong. It sounds too real. This article in Esquire magazine, it sounds too real. They actually gave, for example, a one is a 700 hertz tone and a 900 hertz tone makes a one on this weird device that can make free calls anywhere in the world called the blue box and a two is 700 and 1100 and a three is 700 and that's all they gave they didn't give a whole list steve and i said could this be real so we went down to the one place i knew that you could do computer research when there were no bookstores or magazine stores with anything on on computers at all back then the top research institute in the world then was the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. The smartest people in the world worked there. You could drive in on a Sunday, drive to the main building, and you'd always find at least one door unlocked because the brightest people in the world don't lock doors. <laughs> and we'd go into the library, the technical library, where we learned about so much about computers. And finally, we found a book, and it said, a, it was a, a telephone company book, and it said a 700, 900 makes a one in this one situation. 700 and 1100 makes it two, and it had the whole list. Steve and I looked at each other, and we were just queasy, and we couldn't believe it. This thing is real. So I went out, and I designed a nice digital one that year at Berkeley, and used it to explore the network. But if I ever phoned my relatives down in Orange County, California, I paid the long distance charges right on my dorm phone. I didn't use this device to make free calls. I used it to explore the network and see where I could get around to and, and go up to a satellite and over to, over to Russia and down, over to Tokyo and then to London and then back around to the next dorm room. You speak in one phone, you'd hear it the next one a second later. Who would believe it was possible to put little tones, beep, 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 into an American phone and make calls for free anywhere in the world? Who would believe it? And I love interesting things they could make movies out of. So Steve Jobs, um, and was with me on this, and, and he came to the dorm one day and he said, we can sell these. He was the salesman, I was just the creator. <clears throat> and we did, we actually sold some, and I feel guilty about that. 
because I helped other people just make free calls to their girlfriends, and that was not my purpose, my personal purpose, but probably why I didn't get caught. I was probably just this, this side of being arrested. <laughs> okay, we have a question over here. Uh, oh, uh, hi. Um, Two-part oh, question, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Uh, when Steve Jobs went to Xerox Park, did you go with him? Yes. And there's a lot of tech that can't, comes out of Rochester that contributed to the iPhone, like Gorilla Glass, OLED. Does it, does it surprise you that Rochester is still, you know, producing technology? No, anywhere in the world, especially anywhere in this country, I'm not surprised at all. My travels, there's so much going on. Big advances in technology all over the country. Silicon Valley largely got its reputation because it had the first start with the transistor that was going to be the seed of everything that happened in the digital world. But also venture capitalism grew up early in Silicon Valley and venture capitalists didn't want to travel to your board meeting in Rochester four times a year. Too heavy a travel effort. So they'd say, yes, you can start your, we'll fund your company but you have to come to Silicon Valley to start it. And that happened too. But nowadays, I'm glad to see it expanding all over the world. People are realizing, you know, almost anything you think of that's new is going to really come from um, largely software and internet and, and broadband and those sort of things. So anywhere can happen, any kind of technology, even hardware, and electronic technology, and new ways of making chips so it doesn't have to be so restricted anymore. Anyway, I'm glad to hear, I'm always glad to hear about it. People who have stories, you know, of things that contributed to the modern digital world. All right. Uh, I see a gentleman standing. <coughs> young woman here. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Victor, and uh, my question is: I'm wondering if there's like a like greatest piece of advice you have for like in inventing or um, building. Building your company, uh, like, is there like one thing or like a, a couple of things that if you felt like you didn't do, uh, you wouldn't have had your uh, wonder streak for ten years? Yeah, the first thing I think of is, do you want to just start a company, or do you want to invent a particular thing that you've been thinking about for a long time that is really your passion? And uh, and that matters to me because a lot of people just want to go off now and start companies and follow some formula and any idea is worth it. No, you better have really good business thinking that you're gonna want to build a business that will make money, will survive on its own. You better have good marketing that understands what to build and why it's valuable and where it fits into the world. And you better have good engineering. And the engineering should be involved in thinking out what your product is. The people that would know how to build it, maybe in their home, maybe in their, um, maybe in their garage. Uh, but they'd be able to go into a little laboratory and and actually can caught some demos at least. Go as far as you can on your own money because if you ever get venture capital, you'll own more of it. You have a really good story to tell. And always be honest, if you recognize something else that's really doing a job better, be ready to sway and go that way. Don't, don't try to fight it just because you have one idea and somebody else has another. Um, so that's the type of honesty, always be honest. Um, to, to the core. Don't don't make things up. You can get in a lot of trouble. I mean, huh, there are no such engineers. <laughs> right back to you. This gentleman was standing over here. You, sir, in the blue shirt. Howdy. So thank you, Steve, for coming to Rochester and talking today. My question is, what are you hacking on these days? It's really funny to ask, but I sat back in Apple's glory for 30 years or so. Get all, all, keeping up with all the latest outcoming Apple products, and even I'd buy the Androids and, to understand them. You can't really compare and talk about something unless you personally use it. You can't say it's bad for user interface or good unless you use it in what ways it's bad or good. Um, and I'd keep up with all the Apple apps that were coming out, the iPhone apps and the software on the computer. And, you know, I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, I used to develop stuff. And those were the most fun days of my life. You know, and I can impress people. And I said, well, you know, I'm a little past that time frame. I'm not in the university studying modern engineering and languages and all that. So I picked up a Raspberry Pi, a little computer, 
you know, for $25, now it's down, I like the one that's $5 and $10, the Raspberry Pi Zero. Little computer, and I love, um, I just started going online. I learned some, a lot of Linux, and then I learned, I, I, I found some demos like how to make your own Amazon Echo, your own little Alexa out of a, um, a Raspberry Pi, and went through step after step after step, and I found out that when you follow these, these things online, here's how you do it, here's your project, every single step out of 30 is wrong. Because <laughs> they were done by some college kid with an older version of Linux, and, uh, and I, I worked hard and hard, going to bed many nights, frustrated that something wasn't working, built a bunch of networking stuff with my Raspberry Pis around the house. Um, I have one that I love to use, get on, get on an airplane, connect to United, Wi-Fi.com with it, and then it shares it as another network I named Spanky. Any computer can come onto Spanky and, and get on. So I don't have to switch my phone and my computer the hard way. Um, I, I just, I saw, so I have a little bit of fun with that, and, it's a, and it lets me know that's what I like. Work on something that's hard, and when you finally get over the problems and get it to work, it's the happiest thing in the world for someone like myself. But I'm not really um, hacking on something that would, oh, have some great meaning in life or business. student at RIT and a program manager for Microsoft. Um, so I also had the chance to join Apple Maps as a UX engineer. And then right before joining, I thought long and hard about how I use Google Maps on my iPhone. And then that, that kind of got me thinking about how your perspective kind of plays into competition as to how you've worked on a lot of products and what was your approach as both a creator and an entrepreneur about like you know dealing with competition for the things that you built. Well, of course, competition matters. That's part of marketing, understanding what someone else has and trying not to be behind it. I, I went through many times on my <coughs> my iPhone and computer using Google Maps when Apple Maps wasn't really adequate. Apple Maps has finally gotten up over enough time. It's really become very good. It's my favorite mapping app of all. But second of all, I moved away from Google in every way I could. I only keep two Google apps on my phone even, and one is the maps. <laughs> I forget what the other is, Google Earth or something. Um, but you know, I, but I try to get away from being constantly tracked and understood. A creative person doesn't want somebody else knowing every step you're gonna take before you take it, every word you're gonna say before you say it. Um, and so I only use Google Maps as a, a last backup, sometimes, sometimes to hunt for uh, points of interest. Different points of interest will show up, different maps in different modes. But Apple's, Apple's still my favorite for that because I also trust the company better. I, I enjoy the, uh, the feeling that they are concerned about my privacy. You know, and I can say that as one of the founders of the EFF. We've got time for one more question. We'll go to this side of the that, room. That applies to any competitive product. You know, if it does what you need better, it's okay to use it. Uh, good afternoon, Steve. Uh, very appreciate your humanities when you compare to Google AI and uh, a little child. Um, several years ago when I wrote a trip to Portland, Oregon, I visited uh, the uh, alma mater of another Steve, your business partner, Reed College and the liberal arts college. Well, not quite an alma mater. Yeah, so. I drove uh, him up to Reed when he went to college, or almost went. All right, so I'm very curious, what's your view as a technologist about the liberal arts college liberal arts education in this very challenging digital age. Thanks. Liberal arts education is so important. You're thinking with an analog mind, you're thinking of a lot of considerations, and you're being creative. Um, you're thinking, you're learning a lot of things that other people know. You don't have to be a technologist. You know what? Some people just don't have it built into their system because of the friends they had in early school years, the teachers they had. Um, STEM subjects aren't necessarily for everyone, you know, and if they are, you should be, get all the facilities to expand and grow on it that you want, and if not, if you really enjoy literature, you know, or, or even uh, uh, other arts like music or, uh, or drawing, that should be, you know, follow your passion life, follow your heart's much more important than anything else. Um, I think the liberal arts, though, I don't see that they've been taken over by, uh, you know, uh, STEM digital engineering type 
programs in schools. I don't see that at all, so I don't, I don't really worry about them. You want, I look at, you're talking about college, colleges and universities, and what I tell people is not, you should pick your school according to where you're, you're gonna go in life. That's like, I'm putting my values on a person, telling them maybe they should go to the school because it's got a high reputation in a certain area. You know, maybe it's even MIT. It's better, to, it, no, it's better to, uh, you know, follow your heart. You're gonna learn as much, no matter, one thing I found out in my early school years, thank God my parents thought this way. Let me follow my heart. I mean, I flew out of the country to a, a school, first time ever out of, out of California, actually. First time ever out of California. Flew with some friends at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and it snowed that night, and after walking in the snow, I'd never been in snow, I wouldn't apply to any other school, even though I could design any computer in the world in two days, and I had 800s at all the college entrance exams. No, that was the school. My parents let me follow my heart, and I did the same thing with my own kids, and uh, um, so you should, uh, you should go, I forget where we started, but uh, no, it's, I, t I tell them, you're gonna learn as much, it's in your head. You're the one who gets the same education, no matter where you go to school, even if you do it online, but it's gonna be the most fun four years of your life. And every year was more fun than the prior one for me. Independent thinking, that's the first time you can be so independent in your thinking, and um, so that's the way I look at it. There's no right or wrong answers, and trying to make a right or wrong answer for somebody else, well, that sort of is wrong. Well, this is a good place to, a good end note on education. We're running out of time for our chat with Steve Wozniak, but we want to thank you, Steve, so much for joining us. Chamber team was all wearing black t-shirts. I, I thank them. Uh, they, Susan George could not be here. They just did a phenomenal job today. Uh, thank them for all the work they've done. The Convention Center team, uh, who we don't do a lot of live events. I mean, this is COVID, this is really the first few times we've done this. They've been fantastic, but the way to have you show up today really makes such a huge difference. So I want to thank Venture Center team, Jim Brown, the entire team of men and women who served us today. Um, and our technology people, I know CMI is going back, thank them, but just to close by saying this, uh, this is the first year we changed the, the Rock on Tech Conference. So we try to really elevate things, try to bring more thought leaders here. We've had many thought leaders in the audience. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. The people who are here have come, you've brought so much to this from business, higher education, even some secondary folks. I think just the, the synergy in this room is fantastic. We want to build on this. 
we want to create more excitement, we want to create more opportunities. There's so much here now, and I, I've said this before I, to a couple of people during interviews today, I don't think we tell our story well enough. I just, you know, born and raised here. This place has so much in terms of technological history, it was mentioned by Xerox a few minutes ago, Kodak, right through the present. So much talent, so much expertise, so much in terms of innovation, and also so many opportunities for young men and women who don't have that yet. And I do think that's going to be the, the path forward for us to really transform this community. And I do think we will make a phenomenal technology hub for a city our size. And really thanks to the people in this room. Our promise next year is to come back in 2023 to make this, if we can, bigger and better every year. We want to keep the excitement going. We want to keep the, the, really the momentum going for Rochester and this region. I think there's so much going on right now. But you really made it happen today. This is a sellout today. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of a super busy, busy schedule. Uh, to be here, be part of this today. Now the fun begins. Uh, take Steve to the airport, now the cocktail hour comes and networking, so now's the time to really relax. Uh, hopefully get a chance to network and make connections and relationships here.